Alrighty, uh, as we come to Father's Day and we think about Father's Day, uh, we want to keep in mind that uh, the best we know about Father is God. He is our Father. And we worship God and we praise God and we honor God and we give Him glory and praise and, and just lift Him up and we stand in awe of Him. But I want to hone in on that uh, aspect that we give Him honor, okay? And so I ask myself and I ask you, why is it that we honor God, okay? Why do we do that? We honor God because of who He is, okay? And that brings forth a, a very prominent... Um, teaching and understanding of how God wants us to live in this world because we are supposed to be Christians. And what does that word Christian mean? Christ-like, small Christ, mirror image, an image of Christ, and Christ is God. And so as we think about fathers and we think about our fatherhood, uh, we need to pattern ourselves after God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, our God. Okay? And He is a God that is very loving God. He loves us. He bestows His goodness upon us. Uh, he shares His glory with us. He shares His grace. Uh, he desires, now this is one thing that God does and it's part of His makeup and part of His attributes. He desires praise and worship and honor. And that's why he created mankind, because he wanted mankind to love and to honor and to worship him. And of course, Adam messed all that up, and we're fighting the fight right now. But God made, or Jesus made it right when he died on the cross of Calvary. And we came back to uh, God as children whenever we accepted what Christ did. And we turned over lordship of our life to him and was brought back into the family of God. So he desires these things, but he also wishes for us to have all the benefits that he can give us. For God so loved the world, right? He loves us. So whenever we're thinking about fathers this morning, we want to think about if we are to be the fathers that God calls us to be, we need to love as God loved. And even in Ephesians uh, chapter 6 there, uh, God says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. He gave himself for it. Uh, and I brought out many times a message on that, that. That's the idea of becoming what our wife or our family or our children need. What it needs us to be. What did we need of God our Father? We needed a Savior. So in the fullness of time, in God's timing, God so loved the world that he gave himself. His only begotten Son on the cross of Calvary. He became the Savior we needed him to be. To do that, he had to give up his seat on the throne of glory for a moment in time to come to this world and to be born of a virgin, to go through the birth uh, experience just like you and I have, the growing experience, and to live in a body that was prepared for him so that he could accomplish that which we needed. Okay? And even beyond that, in Malachi chapter 3, I like to quote that verse. That God, uh, you know, is immutable. He doesn't change. He's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And uh, because of that, he says that if, if we will come back to him, if we'll obey him, if we'll follow his will and his direction through the word of God, he said, try me if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you. God wants us to have. He wants to make sure that we as his children uh, have everything that we need need and even sometimes what we want in this world. So as we go into our study here and we look at a few verses, uh, we want to remember that what we as fathers and what the fathers of the Old and New Testament did is they patterned themselves after our God. And that means that we are here to serve the families that God has given us. Okay? Go with me to the book of 1 Kings. I'm going to be reading 1 Kings chapter 9, and we're going to uh, 
Look at verse 15, uh, 14 in particular. I may read, uh, my, I'll probably go 1 through 8 maybe as we read down through this. But I want to remind you as we get into this in Kings, basically the book of Kings is the story of the kings of Israel. Okay? And it actually starts out a little bit with David, but it starts out with the end of David's life. And so really the first king it picks up on that shows us much about what's going on and God's will in his life is King Solomon, okay? And uh, I'll refresh your memory, uh, who was Solomon's mother? Bathsheba. Bathsheba, okay. Well, what distinction does Bathsheba hold in David's life? Boy, she, she have. Okay, he was a sin, and she was a sin in David's life. And we discussed it a little bit in Sunday school here a few weeks back. You know, was it that Bathsheba really had a, a say in that? You know, I mean, that was king. You know, kings had certain rights back then, so on and so forth. So David had a sin with Bathsheba, and it is sort of uh, puzzling to me why it is that God would make her son the king over Israel. Or not only that, by making him king over Israel, and by the way that she came into the bloodline, she is a relative of Jesus Christ. Okay? And heritage that goes back there. So it's very interesting the way that God did that, but it picks up with Solomon here. And if you go back into uh, the first part of Kings there, first Kings, you're going to find out that um, he wasn't in the line of secession. I mean, the first one that was supposed to be king was Absalom. Do you remember what happened to Absalom, David's number one son? I'm the he got hung in the tree. He rebelled against David. Okay, he was going to take the kingdom away from David. And he was David's favorite. That was his favorite son. And he had long flowing locks of hair, you know. And whenever the battle was going on, of course, David gave a command that they were not to kill Absalom. He was not to be killed. But during the battle, his donkey went down in some bramble and bush, and that long flowing hair got tangled up in the bush. Same thing happened to my firstborn. Only uh, my general didn't cut his head off, he just pulled his hair out. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, I had to pull that one on you, Clint. <laughs> okay. But his hair got caught up in the bush, and whenever the general, he killed him. Okay, so he was dead. He was gone. So the second son uh, came up, and whenever David was on his deathbed, uh, getting ready to die, and so uh, I was trying to remember his name, oh, Adonijah. Took my brain a little while. You remember we talked about what, what's Jesus' name in John 1? In the beginning was the Logos. Logos is that uh, operation between the brain and the tongue. I was having trouble with my Logos right then, okay? Okay, but he rose up, and with David on his deathbed, he went ahead and started sacrificing and gathered his people together, and he started celebrating and he started claiming the kingship. He was the one who was supposed to be next in secession as the king of Israel. Well, uh, Nathan, the prophet, and Bathsheba, as a matter of fact, Nathan came to Bathsheba, and they talked about it. David had already said that uh, Solomon was going to reign after him. Okay, He had already anointed him for that. And so they got together and came together and went to David and told him what was going on. And so what David did was told them, okay, bring Solomon in here. And he anointed him with Nathan right then and made him king on his deathbed. Okay, So we come into Solomon here. Now, we're talking about David and Solomon. David was the greatest king of Israel. Uh, God even said something about David. Do you remember what God said about David in his early years? Here's a man after what? Mine own heart. 
Here's a man that thinks and feels and has the same emotions that I, your God, have. I like David. David is blessed, okay? But David sinned, didn't he? And he had to come to a point where he confessed his sin and came back to God. But one thing we find out from these verses that David did right, he was a good father. He was a father that shared with his children how to live and how to walk, how to love God, how to trust God, and how to follow after God. And that's what we're coming into here in chapter 9 of 1 Kings. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon's desire which he pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him in Gibeon. Now back whenever he appeared to him in Gibeon was whenever God said, you're going to be the ruler of Israel, what would you have me do for you? And what did Solomon ask for? Wisdom. I need wisdom. I'm not a wise person. I need wisdom to rule your people. And so God gave him wisdom. And what else did he give him? Great riches. Well, okay. And so we find, we learn that he was the richest king that ever lived. So this is the second appearance of the Lord to uh, Solomon. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me okay so that tells us that Solomon was what kind of a man hmm? he was saved okay he was a godly man but he was a man of prayer he was a man that talked to God and shared with God so what does that bring down to us as men in the example what would she, what should we be men of prayer Men who have constant prayer with God. Men who have regular, dedicated times of prayer with God. Okay? I have hallowed this house which thou hast built, and put my name there forever, and mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. Talking about the temple, Solomon's temple. Now we talked about this before. There are going to be three temples, okay? There has been two. There was Solomon's temple that was destroyed. And then there was a temple that was built at the coming back of the children of Israel into the land. And it was ultimately called Herod's temple. That's the one that Jesus walked in and taught in and shared in. The third temple is yet in the future, which we know as the uh, third temple or the tribulational temple. As a matter of fact, the Antichrist will okay its building, okay, to get in good with Israel and so on and so forth. So God said, of the first temple he said I'll set my name I'll set my eyes I'll set my person here and what does that word perpetually mean forever, forever from now on keep on well did God's presence stay in the Solomon's temple forever no, no Solomon's temple didn't last forever why not Listen, verse 4. And if thou wilt walk before me, now here's what I wanted us to see mainly here. As what? David. David, thy father, walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments. Then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. So in other words, Solomon, your daddy taught you right. Well, how did daddy teach him right? And how should we as fathers teach our children right? We should teach them, as David did, to walk in integrity of heart. You ever think about what integrity means? You should, because for several years, I had words of the years up here on the overhead. Remember that? And integrity was one of them. 
Integrity is that I am truthful, I am honest, I do the right thing that's to be done, I act, I behave, I think properly, no matter if anybody else sees it. If I'm out on a desert island all by myself for the rest of my life, if I am a man of integrity, I live in the right, truthfulness, honesty, straightforward, living godly. Integrity. We live with integrity in our heart and we teach our children to do the same. And in uprightness. Uprightness is doing what God tells us to do. And there's a lot of ways God tells us to do things. You remember what they are? We studied five. He does it through the Holy Spirit always. That's number one. And the Holy Spirit does it by the Word of God. We read the Word. Now it may not have everything in here. It might not have in here, John Townsend, you're not supposed to build your own airplane and go try to fly it. You know, it's not in there, but the principle is there, right? The principle of the Word of God is in there. So we understand the very Word of God. We understand the principle that God lays out to us. Now, what does that entail? That entails study to show thyself approved. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, but rightly abiding the word of truth. We need to be in there. We need to be listening to good teachers, preachers. We need to be listening to the Holy Spirit as we read and study and understand. And we need to understand what it means to walk in righteousness before God. My favorite verse is Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, right? Be out here witnessing and sharing Christ and his righteousness. In other words, what righteousness are we talking The righteousness that God portrays to us through the word of God, through the life of Jesus Christ and his walk. So the word of God, what was the next way we hear God's word? Prayer, okay? And they work hand in hand. We studied that. Whenever you're reading the Word of God and God's Word is on your heart and in your mind and you go to prayer to talk to God, the Holy Spirit will bring up thoughts and ideas and He'll bring up what you have read in the Word of God and He will teach you through those moments and it'll be moments that you can meditate upon Him and His Word and allow that to permeate your heart and your life and your being and you make commitment to God to be that way. Holy Spirit works through the Word of God, through prayer. What else? Through other people. God's church. God's, you know, don't have to be in the church. It's fellowshipping with other Christians. Even your family. Helping one another to grow. That's a big part of marriage. A great big part of it is when we can very tactfully and lovingly share and help each other to grow in the things of God. Now, you married folks or folks that have been married out here, who in this world will be as honest with you as your wife or husband will be? No, not many of anybody, okay? But hopefully we're doing that again with tact, with love and we're helping one another to see our faults to see the places we need to grow but not only that to have the benefit of praise from our spouse you guys leave out of here and every now and again you'll take my hand and say pastor that was a good sermon pastor I enjoyed that sermon and I appreciate that but I never appreciate it more than whenever Yvonne says it Whenever we're riding home from morning worship service, and she says, that was a good sermon. Now, I know I didn't do it. I yielded my life to the Holy Spirit. I took what he gave me and I allowed him to use me while I'm standing up here talking. But it does my heart good for my wife to say, you honored God well today. And it doesn't come as sweet and as loving from anyone else than it does from her. Because she is special to my heart, right? But God made it that way so that we could help and to grow. And thinking about fathers to children and mothers to children is the same way. 
We need, yes, correct them. We need to point out when they're wrong. But we also need to have those times that they hear from mom and dad, I'm proud of you. You did a good job. And you lift them up and you give them praise. But we walk in righteousness. Okay, last one. How does God speak to us? Circumstances. What happens in our life? We studied a little bit about that in Sunday school this morning. You know, God uses every situation that comes into your life and sometimes things come up and we scratch our head and we, we hide our face and then we say, Lord, why did you let this come? You know, why did you let this happen to me? Uh, how come it is you're bringing this upon me? And God's got a reason for it. He's working in the background, okay? But the circumstance is there, and can I change the circumstance? Can I change the way someone else talks to me, or thinks about me, or behaves themselves in my presence? I can't change them. No. Only thing I can do is react to my reaction to the, what they're doing. And God wants us to learn and to grow and to be more like Him, but God speaks to us at those times in righteousness but then he says then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom because that was a promise to David you follow my will my way my walk what I tell you to do and you'll always have a, a king on the throne now does Israel have a king right now no no the last king that was in Israel the last king was from the lineage and line of David, Solomon, okay? Now, who do you suppose will be the next king of Israel? From the same lineage. From the same lineage? Jesus. Okay, that's what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to the rapture of the church, and then we're going to have the tribulation when Jesus takes care of uh, the, the disobedience and sin upon the earth. And whenever he comes back at the end of the tribulation, it tells us that he's sitting astride the back of a white horse, and across the vesture of his thigh is written what? King of kings and Lord of lords. And he comes here with us following him, by the way, as the battle of Armageddon, and ushers this world into a thousand year reign of Christ when he's the king. Okay? So God fulfills his promises. He gives his promises. Okay, now fathers, that's what God calls upon us to be, like Him. And how do we do that? By yielding to Him and being the godly men that He calls us to be. Very quickly, I want to run through a few scriptures here. Turn to uh, Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs 20, verse 7. The just man walketh in his, are you there? What's that word? Integrity. Integrity. We just went over that. His children are, what? Blessed. Blessed after him. You want to bless your children? Don't make sure they have a big inheritance to get. As far as money and goods and house and lands. But walk in integrity before your children and teach them integrity. I've been married now for going on 52 years. Is that right, dear? Be 52 this year. And one reason that I've made it that long, one reason Yvonne and I have stuck together and we've been married that long, the biggest one is Jesus. We've relied upon him. But my dad, through his actions, taught me how to stick with and love the wife of his youth. My mother was quite the hellion every now and again. She was the baby of the family, and that probably played a part in it. But she'd get her dander up, and buddy, she could throw one fit and a half. I remember one time peeking through cracks in the door in the peephole, us kids were, and there was an argument started, and they sent us out of the room in the dinner time, and uh, we heard a big crash in there, and Dad came out with gravy all over the side of his face, you know. But he stuck with his wife. 
Okay? Now, that does, I, I'm not pulling on Dad's bad points. He had them too, okay? But it, it wasn't a, 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 just a storybook love, you know, all along. But he stuck it out. And one thing that uh, he got from his father is you should stay with the wife you use. Now, but my dad taught me that by his actions, by his ways, and, and as he walked in this world. By his integrity, he taught me, and hopefully I've taught that to my, my sons and my children, you know, that they'll pick up on that and go with it. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Now this is when the children of Israel were getting God's commands and God's law, okay? And this is what God's sharing with them. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt walk, talk of them when thou settest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Fathers, we need in the walk of life and even in the practice of being the priest of the household, the teacher of the household, we need to be teaching the Word of God. Psalm 127. Look at Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. Lo, children are a headache of the Lord, and he gave them to you to chastise you. I was just checking to see if y'all were reading. Are you reading along with me? Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. In other words, they're not ours, really. God gives them to us. They're our heritage, our inheritance. He gives them to us that we might benefit by them, that uh, he might benefit by us raising them. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed when they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Arrows. What's an arrow good for? Killing. Well, killing, for, to be shot, to be used. But it's put into a bow, and the skill of the archer guides that arrow to its dependent target okay so what kind of a job have we done in raising our kids okay now from the time it leaves the bow till it gets to the target does the archer have any control over it no is it going to reach the mark that God calls for your children to be it's what you do when you have it in your control. And folks, from experience, I'll tell you that's not long, okay? Because whenever kids are four and five, they don't understand a whole lot. I mean, you're teaching them from the cradle even. You're teaching and you're guiding and they're hearing and they're uh, understanding what happens with you and in your household and everything else. But, it, you know, it's not really till they get up to about, what, six, seven, that you can really get through with them for some uh, principles and things like that. And then at 16, 17, 18, they're ready to go. They're fed up. I don't want to be a part of this family anymore. I want to be out on my own. I want to do this. So it's a very short bracket of time that we have. Does that mean we have no influence over our children once they get in their adulthood? No, it doesn't. We still have influence. We still have that love and so on and so forth. But most of it are in those years. And so we need to make the mess. To be, mess <laughs> we need to make a mess of it. No, that's not what I mean. We need to make the best of it. Okay? 
those arrows that you're shooting for. And in closing, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Use this almost every Father's Day. And uh, God meant for it to be that way. Ephesians 6, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Now I could back up and read a little bit about how husbands ought to love their wives and who they ought to be. I mentioned that as I opened up service. You know, become who we need to be for our families. But it gets down to the end of where God's talking to the children here in chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is what? Right. We talked some about Hophni and Phinehas in Sunday school this morning. They were Eli's children, okay? And God killed them because they were disrespectful to the temple of God. But God also punished Eli. Do you remember why God punished Eli? He didn't correct them the way they should have been corrected. He didn't raise them right, okay? So parents, dads, we have a part in our children obeying us. We need to be putting forth that correction. One thing, I, one thing I remember back that I was not very good at because I've always had a little trouble with memory is being consistent in the way I corrected my boys. You know, to, to make sure you remembered what they did, when they did it, and then uh, you follow up on that later on. Remember what you said you were going to do, and you do that, and so on and so forth, and you follow through with it. Now remember, I wasn't the sharpest on that, but that's what we're talking about here. Be consistent in doing that. Children, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long upon the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We give our God, our Father, Heavenly Father, honor because he deserves it. Amen? We as fathers should get honor. God says that right here. Honor your father and your mother. But folks, we need to deserve it. Amen? And in verse 4 there, that word uh, provoke and the word wrath are talking about God's wrath. And provoking is to push your children into, to direct them of what you're doing with that bow before you release them. Don't push them into being sinful creatures so that they receive God's chastisement and God's wrath. Father, we give you praise and glory and honor. And I ask you, Father, that each father here today might receive the love and the honor and the glory that, Lord, they deserve for being the head of the household, the father, and doing all the things that they do. But, Father, I also pray that we as fathers might earn the right, that we might follow so much in your footsteps and your likeness that, Lord, we deserve that honor. Now, Father, lead, guide, and direct us this morning, for I pray in Christ's name. Amen.